Chi Uncle Gold Podcast. And five, four, three, two, one. Hi everybody, welcome back to the Uncle Gold Podcast. My name is Borna Zober and I started this podcast to bring value to everybody listening by inviting cool guests that will uh, talk to you about how to get the gold in life. And most people didn't have the rich uncle that teaches us like how to get it, but we have to figure it kind of on our own. And it's always good to uh, hear some advice from other people and learn along the way. Um, so today I invited uh, Rachel Bradbury. Uh, Rachel, welcome to the Uncle Gold Podcast. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here. It's awesome to have you here. Um, I've been looking forward to this interview because I feel that you can bring a really, really cool perspective to everyone listening right now. Um, as we chatted a little bit before the podcast, um, a lot of people are home because of 2020 and everything that happened. And uh, you're in a type of business that kind of um, offers a unique solution to that situation, right? So uh, for everyone listening, can you introduce yourself a little bit and uh, tell us what you do and kind of how did you get here? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I work kind of in a myriad of ways, um, but I started off my business as a virtual assistant. And well, actually, even previous to that, I had been going to photography school and started a freelance photography business. Um, and then I wanted to be more location independent into working purely online as a virtual assistant. And that over the last just over three years. I just started my fourth year of business actually earlier this month, which is very exciting. Um, it's kind of evolved over those couple of years to be, you know, from virtual assisting to doing copywriting and design and some coaching. And it's kind of rolled into this kind of like hodgepodge of a business, but it's got all these different elements that I love to do. And because of the way that we work on online and we can lean into our strengths and kind of let go of the things we don't want to do, unlike you might not be able to in a corporate role, I've been able to like pull in all my favorite aspects of what I do online and build it into my business. So yeah, I do everything from copywriting to online business management, to designing websites, to um, email marketing, to coaching and consulting. So I work, yeah, in a myriad of ways, multi um, mostly with um, online female entrepreneurs. Um, so whether that is in the back end of their business, giving them support with their design and marketing and copywriting, or whether that is coaching them in uh, starting their own business or helping them kind of do the inner discovery work in order to figure out what it is that they want to do, what their passion is and what their purpose is to follow that um, path. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Awesome. Um, I, I have to tell you, honestly, for the first time when they told me about a um, group for a virtual assist, I was like, wow, that's awesome. Like, can I join as well? And she's like, no, it's just for girls. And I was like, oh, <laughs> come on. Um, but I think yeah, a little I, bit later, they did have a guy join. Actually, we have like one guy in the LFP community. So <laughs> <laughs> lucky guy, right? Um, yeah, um, I, I actually think it's a great idea to do it like that. Uh, because I Kind of get a feeling that there are a lot more groups for guys online and that women might feel that they're kind of being left out and then providing yes. that as a solution just for them might be a great thing and kind of gets the community community and kind of the group working better together yeah i think so for sure uh what i noticed uh especially in well in when i first started my journey and then when i got into coaching um as well a lot of women have and you spoke to this too, um, kind of like lack of confidence going into it. And I think like, I mean, I think everyone does when they go into trying to create a new path that is like diverged from what we would say is like, quote unquote, the norm, mm -hmm. um, you know, societal is kind of like normal going into like that stream of like corporate work or whatever. Um, but I also think that like, because there is a disparity between like men and women in the workplace that there that has been internalized as like a mindset issue as well. So I think having those safe spaces for women to explore and it's not only the great thing about programs like the one that I was coaching in and it still is running is that it's not just focusing on giving you skills. It's also focusing on doing the deeper mindset work so that you can step into those roles with confidence and lead in your business with confidence. I agree on that one. Um, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later because I think focusing on your mindset and working on yourself is a great step for anybody mm -hmm. who's thinking about improving their life. Just 
absolutely do it because it will work wonders. Uh, and it helped me a lot in the last few years that I've been doing it. And I continue to, you know, read and uh, push my boundaries. And um, that's kind of one of the reasons why I started this podcast as well, because I learned most of these useful things online. And it was mm-hmm. by listening to other people like motivational coaches or authors or really cool books. And I felt that um, by bringing more people on to talk about um, topics like that that are really useful, more people will get a benefit out of it, you know? Um, but let's define it first because it's a very broad topic to be like a virtual assistant and uh, be a person that kind of helps you without being there because most people are used to having a, a team in a company and having a bunch of people sitting next to each other. And then if you need something, you just kind of turn around and you, you have people there. But uh, in this last year, we all kind of got confronted with the idea, all right, you can't come to the office. You have to stay at home. Mm-hmm. And now you're everyone's kind of forced to work remotely, right? And uh, before they started or joined your course, uh, I didn't even think of like doing something like that and that it would be, you know, like useful to people. I thought it was like a special type of person that chooses a job like that and doesn't go to a normal company to work, right? And boy, I was wrong. And especially in 2020, proved that, that a lot of people can and should and really have to do stuff like that. So can you unpack the virtual assistant uh, job for us? Uh, what are some of the benefits that you see to them? And what are maybe some of the first steps that a person can do if they're thinking of maybe becoming a virtual assistant? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I, it's so funny because I've been doing this work for three years now and I still have people when I talk about what I do, they have no idea what I do. And when I first started my business and I remember talking to my mom about it and she was asking about it and she was like, so like, are you like a secretary? Are you answering their phones? And I was like, no, 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 I'm not a virtual secretary. Like I'm doing like, at the time when I first started, I was doing like a ton of um, tech integrations. I was doing a ton of uh, lead magnet design. So if you've ever downloaded like a free ebook, that would be considered a lead magnet, um, a way to drive leads into your email marketing platform and your business. Um, and I was doing, mo- that was mostly what I was doing. And I was like trying to explain it to her, but our parents, don't like at least for my parents they don't work in like any of the online space both of their businesses or the work that they do is very physical with people um or products or whatever so it is like this whole new world that we as millennials have kind of created for ourselves and um there's just so many different avenues that you can go down that's the thing that i always try and press upon people who want to work online and it's like maybe you don't necessarily like want to be a virtual assistant like I know a lot of people get hung up on the title but it's just like it can be anything you could be like when I first started I was like a yes woman I said yes to everything I took every opportunity I could just because it was a great opportunity to learn and then over the years I've been able to really narrow down the things that I love to do and so I'm no longer doing like admin work or social media management I'm doing like um, client care for like my clients who have clients, like I'm taking care of their clients and their community. I'm doing their copywriting. I'm doing, designing their websites. You know, I'm doing all the things that I really love. And so virtual assisting, you can kind of lean into so many different niches within the broad spectrum of virtual assisting. Mm, Yeah, I agree. Um, I've seen in the last two years as I was kind of working towards it, um, there were clients who, as you said, somebody needed help with social media, somebody needed help in just checking through texts, someone needed a few calls to be done. So it's a a different uh, like skill base for each client. Mm -hmm. Um, I feel that somebody might say like, all right, at the start, it's too much. Like I don't have all the skills to do all of that. So uh, what are some of the first stepping stones there as, as an entry point? Yeah, honestly, I think that most millennials, even based on just like the way that we interact with one another online, we have skills that are transfer- transferable and everything is figure outable. And so that was kind of how I went into it was I had some skills from having been to photography school and I had some skills from having, you know, done some other schooling in the past, like different school. I've been to like fashion school. I've been to business school. I've done like so many different things, but so I had like all these little things that I could pull from that were relevant that I just needed to learn how to like utilize in a new way in the online space. And so a lot of working online is like 
honestly trusting that you can figure anything out. And if you can't figure it out, you can Google it, you can YouTube it. Like there's so many resources available to us that as long as you can like be a critical thinker and a problem solver, you can be a virtual assistant, honestly. Um, and you have to be like self-motivated as well, I think is the other kind of key. But like those three things, basically, as long as you have those within you or can draw them out of you, you could learn anything online. And so much of it is learning different platforms. Like I didn't know anything about email marketing when I first started. And yet I got a ton of email marketing clients like right off the bat. And once you learn one email marketing platform, you can kind of figure out the rest. They're all very similar. Mm. Um, and you like so many of these platforms have really great customer service, um, like entities that you can kind of like communicate with if you have questions and, um, there's so much that, yeah, you can Google or YouTube. So there's so many resources out there that are free. Um, which I still use a lot. I use the customer service platforms that, you know, these platforms have, I use their customer service. And then I also YouTube and Google a lot still, like, I don't know everything, but I trust that I can figure it out. Yeah. Um, and then the other thing that really helped me was I signed up for coaching to learn about virtual assisting. And yes, you learn the platforms a little bit in there, but the main thing that I learned was like how to approach getting clients and how to shift my mindset around moving from employee to like entrepreneur yeah. um, and holding boundaries with my clients was another really big thing that I have learned as well. And then when I got into coaching, like I accelerated through in the first six months and like hit all my goals, got tons of clients. And then I ended up working for the woman who had, I had hired as a coach, as a, as a coach in her community. And it just kind of evolved from there. And that's how I ended up meeting Dea. So Hey, if you love using YouTube, I recommend the free Chrome extension called TubeBuddy. It allows you to do some advanced keyword research, cut your publishing time in half, and also rank your videos higher in search. I use them when creating for all my three channels. They have a paid version as well, but I recommend starting with the free option for starters. Uh, they give you a lot of data when watching YouTube, also comparing your stats to other YouTube channels and help me a lot to gain more subscribers and more viewers on my channels. As I said, it's a free Chrome extension, but please use the link down below in the comments. And if you go for the paid version, type in Borna Tubers to get a discount of 20%. And now let's get back to the video. That's a, that's a note to everyone that says that social media has nothing good attached to it. I think there's a lot of good use to social media and connecting so to people too. online. Um, there are, I love the story that you said when you were talking to your mom about what you're doing. Like I sometimes tell my parents and sometimes they're like, eh, but, but they kind of trust that I know where I'm going. So they're like, yeah. all right, all right, cool. Just, you just do it. Right. Um, that's exactly how my mom is. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And um, it was funny, like a few years ago, they were completely against social media, especially my mom. And now that uh, we don't see each other that often, now she's really big on social media because mm -hmm. she can see posts all the time, you know, she can see what I'm doing and all that. So um, even for older people, the perspective changes. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that uh, we'll be having a lot more changes coming to a lot of people, thanks to the internet and everything uh, going on online even with podcasts, like there's so many of them now. And uh, if, you, if you look back with YouTube, like there, there used to be a lot less YouTube channels out there and a lot oh, less really? businesses online. I still kind of mm -hmm. cringe when I see a really bad uh, website of a business or a website that, that's there just with like simple information and nothing useful there. And um, I, I used to tell it to my old boss in Croatia, like uh, he was a very old man and he, kind of shunned upon internet and everything there. And I was like, we need a better website. And he was like, eh, nobody uses that. And I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, um, now like everything is online, right? Especially after how 2020 unfolded, like everyone is online so much more and having, you know, having these resources and having these avenues to send people down, you know, clients or whatever is really useful. It's funny though, because I say that, but I don't actually have a website currently for my business. My business has turned into 100% referral based at this stage. Mm -hmm. I am in the works of writing all my copy and I will be building a business or will, will be building a website um, later this year, but I have survived for the last three years without having one um, simply because I did so much networking because especially with virtual assisting, there's a lot of communities out there that you can join and network with people. And because I had also joined the coaching community as well, I think that also really helped with the whole networking thing, because we now have 
for the laptop freedom program, we now have an alumni group that's like over a hundred people, I think. And so there's people that are dropping job postings and stuff in there. And like, I share job postings in there all the time. Cause I have like more than enough clients right now. So I always send them on to other people if I can. And, um, I haven't needed a website. So I also want to, and this is something that I know in the laptop freedom program that Rebecca teaches, she's now the woman who's running it. Um, is that you don't need a website to be a virtual assistant. You don't need to have all these like shiny flashy things to get started. They can be beneficial later down the road, but you don't have to have them to start. Don't let that stop you. Like lean into your skills first and lean into the free communities that you can be joining to learn skills and network and all that. That's how you really get started. And then after you, after a while, you can build a website if you feel the need. Um, for my virtual assisting business, I don't really feel the need to have a website. Um, but I do want to like with the, where my business is heading with like coaching and also doing some more design work. I want to have a hub where people can see my work and kind of get to know me. So for that, it makes sense. So yeah, it's kind of, for some, it's like, I mean, depending on your business, it's like pretty necessary for a lot of people. So I get that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. What are some of the main skills that people who are thinking of becoming a VA should learn in your opinion? Like what are the, what are maybe the most sought after skills uh, right now online? Mm, that's a great question. I think that there are, it's like such a myriad of skills that are needed. Um, it really depends on like what you, what type of work you want to be doing and the type of people you want to be working with. So for me, I primarily work with female entrepreneurs and actually all of my clients, except for one right now are all online coaches. Mm -hmm. um, it's just kind of the realm I've ended up in. And I, I love it. Um, Cause I am obsessed with personal development and spirituality. So it's like perfect for me. Um, but I think a big one is like learning tech and systems. And that sounds really scary at least to me it did three years ago. Cause I was like, I, I had this story that I was like computer illiterate or like technology illiterate and I like couldn't do it. But honestly, like I was saying earlier, everything is figure outable. If you can think critically, if you can like be resourceful, um, if you can be a problem solver, you can figure all those things out. So tech and systems is something that every entrepreneur needs. Um, and a lot of entrepreneurs don't want to do because they just want to be in their creative genius. So if you can help them to systematize their business and organize their business so that they don't have to be trying to build on the way up kind of thing, you know, you're helping them and creating structure for them. Yeah. Um, that's something that I think everyone needs. Email marketing that's included in that, like project management systems that's kind of included in that, like all of those kind of things I think everyone needs no matter what type of business you run. Yeah. You need a project management system to keep yourself organized, keep yourself on track, know what your goals are, know what your like anchor points in your daily to do's are. And because we're all online, like most places are collecting emails and like, you know, building their subscribers because those are potential clients. So helping with those types of things, I think are super important. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily like the only thing. Cause like also like lots of people need websites built or branding done, or, you know, there's so many different aspects, but, um, I would say for me, one of the, like, not everyone is like a designer and not everyone is like super techie. I have a bit of both, which is great. But um, lean into your strengths, I think, is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. And everyone needs, like, even if, like, you're like, well, I don't really want to do tech integration or I don't want to do design and you love, like, social media, like, people need that as well, helping to build their social media presence or even doing, like, more admin stuff like calendar management and email and box management, all that kind of stuff. You know, like, there's so many different realms you can go into. So it's just, like, determine maybe what you like doing and also like what you feel confident in mm -hmm. and then anything else that you kind of like want to learn like put a pin there being like okay I want to learn this and I'm gonna you know lean into that eventually but these are the things I feel confident in right now so that's what I'm going to start with and then build into that mm -hmm. yeah that's a good tip um, tell us a little bit about your um, program and how you approach coaching like uh, how long does it last and what are kind of the typical students that you get are you wanting to know about laptop freedom program? Yeah. So I don't actually coach in the laptop freedom program anymore, but I can mm -hmm. definitely tell you about it. So 
Um, when I joined it, it was run by a woman named Katie Kidd and her and I ran it together for a while. Um, and she's since moved on and ended up actually selling the business to Rebecca, um, Rebecca Mason. And she now owns the Wanderlust VA and Laptop Freedom Program. And I believe it's still a four month program at this point. So it's four months. She goes through basically um, the pillars are like, I'm trying to think of what they are like, basically the foundations to start your business. Mm -hmm. So setting up all the things that you need, like foundationally to create a solid base for yourself, um, learning, like creating your virtual assisting profile. So that would be kind of like a resume. Um, so it's like pulling from the skills that you have outside of virtual assisting and how they can be relevant. Um, and then how to get clients and then learning some of the tech platforms as well. So there's a little section on design in there. There's a little section on email marketing and a few other things as well to like kind of anchor you in and get you started. So that's kind of what it's based on. And then um, when I was running it with Katie, we were doing weekly calls with clients. So they'd be group calls. Everyone would have like, um, you know, 10 to 15 minutes on the call to get like hot seat coaching one-to-one -one mm -hmm. and receive support on where they were, whether it was needing help with setting up their profile or whether it was needing help, like, communicating with a potential lead or whether it was like closing the deal or whatever, or maybe even working through mindset stuff that comes up a lot. Um, so it's a great program. I recommend it to everyone. If you're like looking to get into starting virtual assisting, um, it's not what I coach on anymore, but Rebecca has such a great team and a great program and can totally set you up. Um, so if you're looking to get into it, definitely check out it's the wanderlustva.com, I believe. All right. We'll leave the links below for everyone listening and watching. Perfect. And um, tell us, where are you now? You're doing coaching for coaches? So um, not coaching for coaches. So I do a couple different things in my business right now. So for the coaching, I'm doing more kind of like life coaching, life purpose coaching. Mm -hmm. So this would be a step either it can either come kind of before or after laptop freedom program depending on kind of where you are i know a lot of people when they first get into the online space and into coaching they want to get into something like the laptop freedom program where they're going to get like quote unquote tangible results where they're being given like information and a skill that they can go and monetize mm -hmm. which i totally get that was the first thing i invested in as well and the next thing i then invested in was more like a life coach to help me figure out like you know, doing some deeper diving into myself and my relationship to help build my confidence in myself in, in my business, but also just in my life um, and really dive into, okay, like what is, you know, my soul's calling? What is my purpose here? So that's kind of more the coaching that I do now is like helping people kind of dissect and dive through the muck, you know, the head trash that everyone has um, from social conditioning and from, you know, from our parents and whatever, as loving as they may be. Um, so I kind of do a lot more like life coaching. I do offer within that some business coaching. If you know, you're, you've just started a business or you're wanting to start a business and helping you kind of decide which path to go or whatever, because I do have so much experience in that realm as well. However, the main focus of the coaching that I do now is more like holistic life coaching, I would say, and it kind of impacts all the different areas of your life. And I can still give business advice or support because of, you know, three years of teaching that already. So that's kind of the coaching aspect. And then I also have my virtual assisting business, which I, I hesitate to even call it that because it's so much, it's become so much more than that. Um, I work directly in women's businesses in the back end. So I help them with systems. I help them with client care. I help them with like creation. I'm like really co-creating with them in their business. So do everything from, yeah, like copywriting, client care, um, design, literally just like in there, helping them co-create their vision for their business and bringing it to life. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Sounds great. Um, we'll talk about that more in the second part of the podcast as well. Uh, I'm, I'm totally into uh, mindset and stuff like that. And I love, um, for instance, Simon Sinek's talk and book will like to start with why. And I feel that a lot of people kind of skip that step and they're just like, yeah, just do work, go, you know, like, and, and they're in the mm -hmm. mindset of just like running down the tracks, but they don't know where the tracks are kind of leading. And um, yeah, I want to go into topics like that as well. Um, tell me, before we go into that, um, let's say somebody is starting as a VA now and they um, acquire the initial skills, they kind of have their goals set and they kind of know where they're going. Um, they're starting to talk to clients and what 
I figured it was one of the like maybe sticking points there is the financial part. I feel that a lot of people have a problem with that, um, not just because of lockdown and losing a job and all that, but in general, I have a feeling that people have a problem with asking for money, asking for a raise, um, you know, like asking for um, price nego negotiation in a business deal, in, in sales, especially. Some people have a hard time saying like, oh, this costs that much or, oh, we have to increase this and um, do you see any like um, improvements there that can be made or maybe some ticks and tr uh, tricks and tips uh, that can help people who are just starting out and mm -hmm. how do you approach it personally? That's a great question. Um, I think anything to do with money is usually a mindset issue and it's usually something that we have been, con we've been conditioned to think that money is wrong, mon money is bad, we shouldn't talk about money, you know, it's so those are all normal things to think and feel um, and you don't have to let them define you um, and define your experience. So I think there's a lot of work that we all have to do, myself included, around the topic of money because we've been conditioned to feel shame around money and to feel awkward around money. Um, but in terms of from like a business perspective, what I want to remind everyone of is like you're providing someone a service that they either can't do themselves or don't have the time to do, and you are making their life and their business easier. And so you have to determine, you know, what is the bare minimum that when I go into a, a negotiation, I actually just raised all my rates with my clients. So this is great. When I go into a negotiation with my clients about my rate, well, for a lot of my clients that I've had for quite some time, I just tell them what my rate is going to be. And, you know, they trust me and love working with me. So they're willing to pay it. That wasn't always, not that that wasn't always the case, but when you first start out with a client, they don't have that rapport, you don't have that rapport with them, right? So what I have done in the past is when I go into a negotiation, I determine what I ideally would love to get paid. And then I kind of determine like, okay, what is the bare minimum that I would be willing to do that feels like a like respectable energetic exchange? Like when, that I would be willing to receive. And then I go into the conversation and usually we would end up meeting somewhere kind of in the middle. Um, and the reason that I say that you need to determine what your bare minimum energetic exchange is that you're willing to do is because if you don't charge people enough money for your services, every moment that you spend doing the work for them, you are going to regret, like feel resentful towards them. You're going to hate doing the work. It's going to take you even longer because you're going to have all this like head trash thinking about like, oh, I really don't want to do like X clients work because I'm only getting paid X amount, you know? So if you, but if you're charging a rate that feels supportive for you and you feel like you're getting the correct energetic exchange for the energetic output that you're doing, then you won't have that resentment. And those you know, head trash thoughts around like, oh, I really don't want to do this because I don't feel like I'm being valued because I'm not getting paid what I think I deserve. So that's something that I always kind of encourage people when they go into those salary negotiation type conversations or rate negotiation conversations is like, what is your bare minimum energetic exchange that you would feel good receiving and don't accept anything less than that. And if it's, if they won't, aren't willing to meet you at your bare minimum, hopefully they would meet you somewhere in the middle between, or even at your highest, but somewhere between your highest and your bare minimum. If they're not even willing to meet you at your bare minimum, you probably shouldn't be working with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. Um, if someone is working a job right now and they're thinking of maybe, um, you know, like doing it on the side until they uh, generate enough income on the side until they can transfer. Would that be the best option? Or do you think that it will be better for someone to just jump in like um, fully into um, working for yourself remotely? Because, you know, like at that point you invest a lot more time. So the chances are kind of higher that you get more clients or how would you approach it personally? Or how would you recommend someone doing it this is a good question. And it's one that I feel gets asked a lot. And I think it's one that can, needs to be continued to be asked by people, because I think really what needs to happen here is you need to determine for yourself what is best for you. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen people who have quit their jobs like completely and dove straight into virtual assisting and been really successful. 
um, because they had that belief in themselves. And then I've seen people who have quit their jobs too soon, dove right into it, but they didn't have the belief in themselves. And so they really floundered and it was a lot harder for them. So I think determining, you know, where your threshold is and where your comfort zone is, we, cause you want to push, you have to push yourself out of your comfort zone in order to start a business. Like yeah. it's just the way it is. You have to, um, no matter who you are going and starting a business for the first time or any new business, any new endeavor is a little bit scary and a little bit uncomfortable and it should be. Um, but you don't want it to be so terrifying and so mortifying that like you don't even feel like you have the capacity to put yourself into it. Cause you're so worried about money or whatever. And that's another thing to consider is like, consider where your finances are. Like, do you have, you know, a couple months of savings that you could live off if it's going to take a little while? Do you have like nothing and you need to be continually earning money? The thing with starting a business, any business is it's not a like instant quick win, you know, like, it's not just like, I'm going to go out and make 10 K like tomorrow from nothing. It's like, okay, it's, be prepared for the fact that it could take a little bit of time um, learning to navigate the ropes and getting started and figuring out what you want to do. And it could take a little bit of time to make some money. So I think it's really about determining where your comfort level is and how far you feel you can stretch yourself. If like leaving your job and like diving straight in is the way that you know that you operate and how you know you will be successful, by all means do it if that literally makes you want to like poop your pants, probably don't do it. Like, you know, find a middle ground, maybe like go down to part-time at your job and then, you know, start your business or whatever. There's lots of ways that you can work around it. Um, Or maybe it's like you still work your full-time job and you work your virtual assisting business like one or two hours in the evening or on the weekend. I've seen people do it all sorts of different ways. For myself, when I first started, so I was working as a freelance photographer and I was also working as a waitress. So I was working like, God, an insane amount of hours per week. I was probably working like 60 hours per week, um, often working like 15, 16, 17 hour days. Like it was, and I was working like seven days a week. It was crazy. Um, And I started my business and within eight weeks, when I started my business, I also booked a one way ticket to South America um, for eight weeks later. And then, so I worked my two jobs, like 60 hours a week. I started my business and I had like a couple clients before I left on my trip, but it wasn't like I was making tons of money. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I like quit both my jobs, left on my trip and pretty much never looked back. I have had one part-time job um, over this like span of time since I started my business. Um, About a year ago, I was serving again, just like very Mm -hmm. part-time. but other than that, like I pretty much never looked back and that's what worked for me. Um, cause I knew that I wanted, like, I wanted to be leaving for South America in March. And so I just booked my ticket and was like, well, I'm going all in, I'm going to make this happen. Like I'm trusting that I can do this. And also I wasn't doing it alone. I was in the lap, what is now the laptop freedom program. Um, so I had Katie's support and I had two other women that were in the program with me. It was the first round that ever ran actually of that program, which is funny. Um, but yeah, I had the support. And so I knew that I could figure it out. I knew that I could make it work. Mm -hmm. And by the time I left eight weeks later, I'd had a couple clients and I had gained a little bit of momentum and I was like, okay, I can really do this. And it's just been continuing on ever since basically. Hey, I hope you're enjoying the Uncle Gold podcast. If you want to support this whole project, make sure you go to the second channel called Uncle Gold Podcast Clips. There I create short form videos with the best topics from the interviews that I do on the main channel. You get their videos daily. They're separated nicely into playlists so you can choose the topic that you want to watch most. And now let's go back to the video. Awesome. How was, how was South America? Oh, amazing. I am dying to travel again. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel a lot of people have that same urge. Like I I remember usually during winter time um, where I'm from in in Zagreb, we get a lot of snow. And in the last few years, there's just like no snow anywhere. And I kind of do miss it. So I was like, all right, it would be great if we can travel somewhere this winter to a a, like a colder place where there's like Mm -hmm. a meter of snow, at least, you know, like Sweden or Finland or something like that. Uh, because I kind of miss it, but yeah, I would, I would also love to do like a more um, tropical version of that trip somewhere. You know? And South yeah. America does sound fun. Uh, which it's countries beautiful. did you visit? 
so I started my trip in Argentina and then I did Brazil. I flew back up to Mexico and then I went down to Ecuador, Colombia, the Galapagos and Peru. Wow. Awesome. Yeah. It was incredible. And then I moved to the, like, and this was all like, so I started my business in January of 2018, left for Argentina on like the 4th of March, I think it was. And then did like three and a half months of travel, came back to Canada for like a month and a half. And then I moved to London mm. and that, that was, so that was in the first six months of my business. Awesome. <laughs> a lot of traveling and uh, I'm sure that the, the laptop was the most important item on the list, right? Laptop and Wi-Fi. And anyone who is thinking about virtual assisting or anything and thinking about traveling, the best places for Wi-Fi, and I know this sounds really lame, but it's Starbucks, no matter what country you're in. Really? Starbucks. They have like the highest speed Wi-Fi. I would be in like tiny little towns in Peru. Mm -hmm. uh, really tiny ones didn't have a Starbucks, but I'd be in pretty small towns in Peru that had a Starbucks. And that would be where I would go to do my work for a couple hours while I was that day while I was traveling. Cause their Wi-Fi is like always really good and like hostel Wi-Fi and stuff isn't always great. So yeah. little hack for you. Look for a nice. Starbucks. Nice. Awesome stuff. Uh, you heard it here first on the Uncle Gold podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, I think a lot more people like I, I sincerely hope that the lockdowns are going to go away and that we're going to go into the mode of, all right, I'm going to travel too. somewhere for three months and work remotely from there. And yeah. I have like, I made a list with Dale of the places where we want to travel and do stuff like that. So we're both kind of working on our um, online businesses. Amazing. Um, I've got the same. <laughs> Yeah, uh, we're from Croatia and Croatia just recently um, made a change in their laws where uh, usually the tourist visa is for like three months. Now they've added like a digital nomad visa where you can stay mm. for a year and work for a foreign company and live in Croatia. So that's that's awesome. That's amazing. Tourists, but the season I love Croatia. Yeah. One of my um, all time favorite places I've ever been. Yeah, it's, it's awesome. But we have a strong seasonality, you know, like after a few mm -hmm. months during summer, everything kind of stops. And then most of the places are empty. A lot of places close up and literally the smaller places on the coast, like you, you can't do anything there, you know, and this is kind yeah. of a way to change that because if you get more people from all over the place, then more places could stay open, you know? Um, so th that's something very interesting for me as well. Uh, well, I mean, we do have Croatian citizenship, so we can go yeah. there anytime. Uh, but it's interesting to me because I feel that a lot of businesses will be built in that way where someone's sitting on a beach and working on their um, business online with someone from the other side of the world and together they'll, they'll make something online. Um, do you see any like trends in technology that are very interesting or businesses and industries that are uh, popping right now? Anything that comes to mind that, they're, that you're looking towards kind of like in the next few years, maybe? Honest, honestly, I feel like I'm like the worst person for that because like I don't really feel like I pay attention to a lot of trends. I kind of like keep to my own thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I'm super, like I was saying earlier, like most of my clients are coaches. I also do coaching. So I'm like really heavily involved in that space. And I have seen how that space is changing a lot or has changed a lot over the last three yeah. years. And it's changing for the better, which I think is great. Um, as far as like technology and stuff, I don't know. I'm like not really up on all like the technology I find. Yeah, like yeah. there's so many marketing trends that I've seen like come up lately. Like, I mean, obviously like TikTok was a really big thing and reels and whatever. And for me, I, I don't like, I think it's, I love watching them, but I don't subscribe to any of that for my own marketing purposes. And some of my clients do them and I think that's great, but I haven't gotten into it personally. Mm -hmm. um, also like I've seen like text message marketing become a thing, which is really interesting to me. Cause like, I don't even like e <laughs> emails in my inbox. Like why would I want to receive texts from someone? That's how I think personally, but yeah, yeah. that's, that's my um, mindset. I, I agree yeah. I'm like, I, I like avoid I my left, inbox, left, like the play just behind us. Like, right? I know. <laughs> so yeah, I've seen like some of those trends come up and I think that they're interesting and I observe them, but I haven't been partaking in them. I think mm -hmm. there is a little bit of this, like kind of millennial culture, I guess, where it, where, well, and I think it's technology culture too, where it's like, there's always like looking for the next best thing. And it's mm -hmm. like, there are actually some really solid things that we should be, I think we should be utilizing more. So as I look into expanding and scaling my business, what I'm actually looking towards is 
going back to the basics rather than looking at the new flashy things. And so by that, I mean, creating SEO driven content. So working on creating a really solid SEO foundation, like website that's SEO driven, like and optimized looking at like YouTube channels, they're searchable, they're SEO driven, looking at Pinterest again, SEO driven, it's searchable. Whereas like Instagram, TikTok, even like emails, I think is a little different. And, but these text messages and stuff, it's just like, it's all like what's of the moment in the minute, in the second, like if we, if you don't see it in your feed, you don't see it. If like, and if you see it, it's like, oh, you scroll right past it. It's very like, you have to have something that's so attention grabbing. Whereas things that are SEO driven, like we're always using, like I use Google, like I don't know how many times a day to search shit. Yeah. And sorry, I don't know if we can swear on this. Uh, yeah, I can. <laughs> My podcast, we like don't have any filter. So, <laughs> um, but like I use Google a lot. I use YouTube a lot. I use Pinterest a lot. I don't really use Pinterest personally to search business stuff. Although uh, sometimes I do for inspiration and stuff. So, mm-hmm. you know, those things are really where, content thrives because you can build like uh, you can have on podcasts that's another one too that's like searchable Mm -hmm. but you can have um like a video like this video that we're making here today in january 2021 could still be making you revenue three years down the road because it's seo driven and searchable on youtube and people are searching like how to become a virtual assistant or like how to like shift from like i don't know employee to ceo or whatever like you know people are searching these things because they're looking for something and that content is popping up whereas social media is just like in the moment whatever is like hot you know so i'm actually looking at going back to foundational stuff versus like what's hot in the moment Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, but you technically are um, at the forefront of a trend because I've been reading a lot about the online education space. And they say that now it's around 2 billion and it's going to go to like 20 billion per year that people are investing into their uh, online education. So uh, you are kind of writing one of the most popular trends now, especially now when everybody got locked down, everybody had to like learn up on new skills. Like for, mm-hmm. first that we all noticed was Zoom. Everyone's like, what is this app like? How do I use it? Like, and now everyone's just used everyone's to it. proficient. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now everyone's kind of like a zoom master where they know all the tips and tricks and change their backgrounds and do stuff like that. Um, so uh, I, feel I like- have never done that. I don't even know how to do that on zoom, which is hilarious. Cause I've been using zoom for like three years <laughs> and I didn't even know that was a thing until 2020. <laughs> <laughs> But I think though, like so much good, like as much as 2020 was like an insane, crazy and awful year in a lot of ways. And for a lot of people, there are, at least for me, and I recognize this is a very privileged way to view 2020. um, There are a lot of good things that I think came out of it. And one of the things for me and for like the online community, I think was like the acceptance of it being real work online and the acceptance of like, being like, yeah, the, the acceptance of like online work and it becoming like normal. And cause I used to talk about my business when I first started it three years ago and people would look at me, like I had like horns coming out of my head or something. Like they had no idea, like it just made no sense to them. It felt so foreign. It felt like a scam. Like, you know, whereas I feel like 2020, like brought to light a lot of different ways that we can create our life and create our business and that all online work isn't a scam, which is great. Um, so I think there's so many good things that have come out of that and it's opened up everyone's perspective as to what's available to them as well. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and when we're at the topic of opening perspectives, you mentioned earlier, going out of your comfort zone. Uh, that's one of the topics that we go back to all the time here on the Uncle Gold podcast about, you know, like just pushing something in your life just a little bit, you know, and it will, uh, you'll reap the rewards after a while. And at the, at the start, it seems like it's far away, you know, but uh, mm-hmm. at the end, you kind of get the benefits while you're uh, used to it. Um, how do you recommend people that they go out of their comfort zone? Like, do you have any tips there? Mm. I think like the one thing that really comes to mind is whatever desire that you have burning within you that is like making you want to push yourself outside your comfort zone is there in you for a reason it's not just like this arbitrary thing that you're like oh i'm just meant to like dream about this for the rest of my life it's like it's there in you burning within you to be acted on and the sooner you act 
the closer it's going to be a lot closer than you think it is. Like, I think people think that they have this like far off dream that's burning in their heart that they're like, Oh, I'll, I'll never get there. It'll never happen. And the reality actually is that it is so much closer than you think. And all you have to do is be brave enough to take the first step. And you're not like leaping from where you are at like a all the way to Z, right? Like you're going to walk through every letter of the alphabet, you know, before you get to that final goal. And also once you reach that goal, there's going to have been something new planted within you through the journey. And you're going to, you know, the goalpost is always moving, right? So it's like, maybe your goal is to start a business. And then maybe the next thing that comes in is like, you know, starting a virtual assisting business. And then maybe I'm just going to give like an example of my own experience. And then the next thing was like, oh, well, wanting to help other people start their businesses, wanting to become a coach. And then the next thing comes up and it's like, you know, maybe it's writing a book or creating a course or whatever. Like it's, you're always going to have these new desires that come up as you follow your path and they're in you for a reason. And the more that you commit yourself to the path and just putting one foot in front of the other, the more of these desires come forward and the more your life begins to expand. Yeah. So if you can just have like, I think there's like this quote, it's from a movie that I, um, watched, do you remember the movie Water for Elephants? I think it was, I don't know. I think it might be that movie. It might not be, but I remember that Matt Damon is in it. Um, <laughs> um, oh, it's not that movie. I can't think of the name of it. I'll have to tell, look well, it up quote. after. Maybe, maybe that'll remind me. The quote is like, if you can basically have like six seconds of courage, like insane courage to just take action the rest will follow basically mm -hmm. is the premise of the quote. I've totally butchered it, I'm sure. But um, basically, yeah, if you can have that insane courage to just send that email or even just like Google search and like, you know, reach out to someone or whatever, like take mm -hmm. that first little step and the next step will be revealed. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. You don't have to know how you're get, gonna get from A to Z. Just trust that if you go from A to B, C will be revealed, D will be revealed, you know, and so on until you reach that end point. I agree on that 100%. And it happened to me a bunch of times now. Um, I talk with a, a friend of mine from Croatia a, a lot about goal setting. And uh, he's basically 10xing every one of his goals. He's like, I don't know how I'm going to do this, but that's something that I want to do. I feel like a passion for it. And I want to push myself. And he really sets like, crazy goals and um, traveled a lot and you know like um, he's in the Tony Robbins self-improvement mindset as well mm -hmm. and we love chatting about stuff like that um, I asked him like um, so what if somebody like hits a wall and he's like oh just like as Tony would say just break through you know and we uh, we um, talk about stuff as it's um, as it is very easy you know to mm -hmm. make it kind of psychologically more easier on ourselves when mm -hmm. we set goals to kind of like make it easier perceptually to pursue it um, and we, we love to like Google people online and learn about these steps and everything. Um, do you have like a list of people that you listen to, uh, maybe some motivational speak speakers that kind of pump you up and, and put you in the right state um, or, or maybe authors that you read a lot about and how do you um, approach these online mentors? Let's say, let's call them like that. Who is it that I listen to and follow? So I really really i actually just read the book untamed by glennon doyle love that book it was very very good um i'm trying to think what who else that i really love um for me i really really loved rebecca campbell she's a little bit more like spiritual and about following your soul's path uh she has a book light is the new black that was the first like personal development spiritual book i think i ever read and it was really transformational for me i really loved it and i still really love her work Someone else that I really, really love, I'm actually doing a program with her right now is Amber Ray. She wrote a book called Choose Wonder Over Worry, and it's all about navigating kind of like your internal world and um, kind of making friends with your feelings and all of the different things that come up like shame and guilt and worry and like, all, you know, courage and all these different parts that we all have inside of us and these, you know, experiences that we all have. So that book was like really transformational for me as well. Um, another book that I really love that I also recently read was is called The Untethered Soul by Michael Singer. Mm -hmm. And it's all about becoming the witness. Because when you are in your mind, in your thoughts, 
are you the person having the thought or are you the person witnessing the thought? Watching the person. Yeah. yeah. So it's about being the observer, being the witness. And I really, really love that. That has been transformational for me as well. Uh, someone else that I love is Brene Brown. She's amazing. Um, her Netflix special is so good. All of her books are incredible. She's awesome. And then honestly, I'm like inspired by my clients every single day. My clients are incredible. Um, a few of my clients have podcasts. If you're looking to start a business, particularly more so a coaching business, but actually even a, ser even a service-based business. So one of my clients, her name's Caitlin Brush. Her Instagram is, I'll send it to you, but it's Caitlin Anne Marie, I believe maybe with an underscore in there. Um, she's great. She, um, is kind of like a holistic business coach. She has a really great podcast called the Pur soul purpose driven podcast. And then another one of my clients whose name is Anna Kinkella, she does a lot of like quantum healing and moving through kind of these emotions and everything and like tapping into your highest, um, from a very spiritual perspective. And she has a podcast called the Mav magic weaver podcast, um, which is really great. So I feel so inspired to work with these amazing leaders. And then there's, you know, people on the bigger scale that have written books and stuff that I also feel really inspired by too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's so many people out there. <laughs> um, you you mentioned uh, earlier that you have a podcast as well. Uh, can you tell yes. us a little bit about that? What's it called? And what are kind of the main topics that you go into there? Yeah, so I have a podcast with one of my like biz business business best friends. Um, her name's Ashley DePaulis. And the podcast is called Hashtag Relatable. And it basically came about because we were having all of these voice notes back and forth on these like deep kind of existential topics and also like being super human too. So it was like really spiritual, also really human and kind of like blending the two together. Mm -hmm. And so we joked that, you know, other people should be hearing these conversations. Like they're really funny. They're also like really relatable. And we like came up with a bunch of jokes and stuff. And so eventually we were just like, let's just do it. Let's start a podcast. So we started the hashtag relatable podcast in November of 2019. We recorded for like a full year. So we have like 52 episodes. I think we did like every single week for a year. Um, you can find it on Spotify, Apple podcasts, and a few other platforms. I can't remember. Um, and, uh, it's great. So we talk about, um, we talk about business stuff. We talk about spirituality. We talk about personal development. It's really about like being as a, in our belief, being a soul, having a human experience and how to navigate that human experience being, you know, something as incredible as this soul that you are and also being very fucking human. So, um, it's really interesting and we get into some really cool topics. We talk about relationships with like intimate relationships, friendships, business relationships, boundaries. We talk about so many different things. Um, and you can, yeah, you can find us on Instagram, um, you can find us on Apple podcasts, you can find us on Spotify. Um, and we actually just took a, what month are we in now? We've had like a two month hiatus. We needed a bit of a break after recording every single week for mm -hmm. a year. Yeah. Um, and we actually are going to be starting recording again in February. So very excited nice. for that. So yeah, we'll be doing something fun for our launch. So if you're interested in any of the things that I just mentioned, go check us out on Instagram and, uh, you know, give us a follow and we'll be sharing some more coming up in the next couple of weeks. Awesome. Um, do you also get like guests on your podcast or is it just you two uh, yeah. talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, uh, we do probably like a guest every few episodes, I would say. So some of it's just Ashley and I like riffing on whatever's like current mm -hmm. for us. We also talk about kind of like what's happening in the world collectively as well. So um, we've talked about like the political climate. We've also talked about, you know, the environmental climate, stuff like that and how it impacts our, how we as humans have impacted it and how it also impacts our human experience. Um, and then we do have guests on as well. So yeah, we've had a, a range of guests on, uh, they're usually friends of ours. Cause we like to think our friends are super cool cause they are, yeah. cause they're doing amazing things. So they're mostly like business owners or, um, you know, doing other cool shit in the world. So it's been really, really great. And yeah, if anyone wants to be a guest on it, feel free to reach out to us. Awesome. Um, again, we'll leave all the links and um, information down below in the comments. Um, tell me, it's a, it's a big topic to unravel, <laughs> like how to improve your life. And uh, I feel that a lot of people have a hard time even starting with it. And um, I, I feel that 
I've invested a lot of energy in the past convincing people that don't want to change themselves to start doing at least something. And I, although I do believe that it's the right idea and the right notion, I kind of changed it in the last few years and I'm not pushing it that much to people who are kind of like, no, this is not for me. You know, I just like suggest it to them and then leave them to their own if they're, if they're interested in it, right? Mm-hmm. But I cannot stress enough the benefits that I had from it and especially stuff like journaling and writing my goals down and simple stuff like that. Mm-hmm. After a while, it accumulates to some really, really good results. And you can notice after a while, like people who are not working on themselves, like have a harder time accomplishing things and kind of focusing down on them. Um, and uh, I always try to kind of assist with a, a, a useful tip that I think it's like journaling. It's, it's a great thing. You know, like um, when I think about journaling, the first time when I heard about it was in like elementary school and we were like really, really small kids. And then people tell you like, oh yeah, you should, you know, like write a journal and someone in your class should like uh, write a note for you there and stuff like that. And then as we get a little bit older, by the end of elementary school, we're like, oh, no, this is for kids, you know, like, why should I be writing a journal, right? And uh, then, like, you would look differently at people who are writing their journals, you'll be like, oh, yeah, bookworms, you know. And and, Yeah, uh, or like, oh, dear diary, like, people would, like, shame you for it, totally. Yeah, and there's, like, um, you know, like, romantic comedies on it, and you'll be like, oh, come on, like, why should I write a journal, right? Uh, but we have then, so much to learn from children. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, children are awesome. Um, they the, the the not having a barrier in life that's just like a win win situation. I feel mm-hmm. that we need a lot more of that. And um, when you when you start reading like personal development books like Tony Robbins, for example, all of them encourage you to kind of write down what you're doing, and as you measure it, you kind of get closer to accomplishing it. And I just started doing it. I, I bought a, um, like an empty notebook and wrote down like success journal, you know, and then I was writing stuff that I noticed in my work and company. And at the start, it was like all over the place and didn't have a lot of structure. But then after a while, I kind of, you know, like structured it better and organized it. And um, I noticed that if I added like color, like uh, putting like green uh, checks that I've yeah. done stuff, then, then I feel better about it. And like, if I want to punish myself after I didn't do something, <laughs> I put like a big red X and then I'm like, oh no, that hurts. you know. <laughs> and uh, I'm having fun with it and it gives me great results. And that's why I like... I, always um you know recommend it to people uh, because i feel good benefits from it mm-hmm. and it's not something that can help you overnight but one mm-hmm. of the main things that helps me in the moment is if my i don't know head is overloaded with like 50 things by writing just one page about stuff that i'm currently doing or thinking about it gets like 70 percent easier at least because i, I kind of like brain dumped You're not it on carrying her. it yeah, yeah and, and I, I can't explain it but i feel a lot better i'm like all right and, and nothing big happened it just like transferred from mind to paper and i visually see it in front of myself it's a little bit more organized and a lot of times i turn it into to-do lists and then just scratch things off that i did and it helps mm-hmm. a lot Tell me, do you do journaling do you recommend it to your uh, coaches yeah and how does it work for you I have, yeah, I have a lot of different practices that I do to support myself in that way. And journaling is one um, I've had a complicated relationship with, but I I do really love it. Um, And I think that complicated relationship has come from some of that conditioning that you were kind of speaking to where people, you know, you do it as a kid and you get made fun of like writing in your like dear diary, and then you feel shame around it and you don't want to write in it again, or you, I know that was like one issue for me. And then another issue that I kind of had to move through with journaling too, was this thought that I needed to have it's perfectionism. It's this thought that I needed to have all my thoughts fully formed and perfect before I wrote them down. Um, so that would stop me too. I like, if I wrote messy or if I like had to cross things out or whatever, it was just like so much judgment on Mm -hmm. my thoughts. And it's just like, it's just need, you just need to get it out of you. So, um, I, I have had many journals over the years and it's only really been in the last like couple of years and even the last couple of months actually for me where I've kind of cultivated a more regular journal practice Mm -hmm. and given myself permission to 
create chaos on a blank page, you know, like just like open my journal and like word vomit out onto it, basically whatever is coming through without judgment. And like you said, it makes things like 70% easier because you're not carrying all of this stuff that's like swirling around in your head and it's just like, so it makes it so much easier. So I always do recommend journaling. I know it's not for everyone though. Um, So I think that there's, I mean, I think there's a lot of ways that we can process another way um, that has actually been helpful for me last over last year, 2019 was a really hard year. And when I started the podcast with Ashley, that actually was a great way to help too, with like moving through some head trash Mm -hmm. um, is just having the opportunity to just like speak it out and talk about it and like learn from it. And so you don't have to start a podcast to do that. Maybe it's talking with a friend that you feel really safe and comfortable with, you know, maybe it's, leaving yourself voice notes and you don't ever have to listen to them. You just leave them and Mm. they're out. It doesn't matter. Just get it out of your head, you know? Um, So there's lots of different practices that you can do, but I do think for me, I really do like the tactile, like journaling. I find like, it's very cathartic for me to like write it all out and just like let it it flow onto the paper. It does feel like talking to a friend, right? Yeah, totally. It kind of has the the same effect. Yeah. I like to think of it. um, I didn't even realize that I thought of it this way until it just popped through. Um, So I don't know if you're familiar with kind of like the um, concept of like the higher self. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah. So for anyone who's not familiar, the concept of the higher self is basically this version of you that is like filled with love and light and compassion for self and is like on the path that you're already on she's kind of further down the path you know and like leading you forward down your soul's path or he is leading you forward sorry talking about myself (laughs) um so I almost think of it as like I'm writing to my higher self Mm -hmm. and like she is the friend that I am communicating with and Mm -hmm. in communicating in that way to her through my journal, even just like she's, I mean, she can write back to me. If I tap into her, I can write a response to myself or even just like reading it back. I can then hear her and hear Mm -hmm. what she would say to me and what I need to do next or what guidance I have or what compassion I need to offer myself, you know? So Mm -hmm. I think that's like a really great way too is like, yeah, thinking of it as like writing to a friend or your higher self or whoever. So it doesn't feel like I'm just writing in this book of like nothing. Yeah, I agree. I do uh, something similar. Um, I, I look at like the future Borna and yeah. I, I go in like five and 10 yearly yeah. uh, increments. And then I'm like, all right, the 40 year old Borna is talking to me. And he's like, it was a good idea to start a podcast, you know? Yeah. And I kind of tap myself on the back and be yeah. like, yeah, that was a really smart move. You know, now you have a really successful podcast and you're spreading a good message and you help so many people. And I'm like, yeah, see, he is proud of me, you know? And, and I kind of do that loop where I, yes. um, fr- from the future, kind of talk to myself. Um, I don't do it all the time but sometimes when I'm kind of thinking about stuff that I love doing then I kind of um, try to visualize what might happen with Mm -hmm. if I continue doing it for another few years what might be the result right Mm -hmm. I do a lot of work with the future self as well it's so helpful I've been doing a lot of it recently because I'm working on this creative project that I'm super excited about but also like shitting my pants about it's terrifying because it's like it feels like a big thing um so yeah working with the future self can be really really potent Mm -hmm. and um if anyone is looking to work with the future self my client Anna Kinkala that I mentioned who has the magic weaver podcast she does a lot of work with the future self and actually has a really great med- free meditation on her website that you can opt in for. Um, it's like a 20 minute meditation working with the th- future self. And I've done it like five times this last week and it has really shifted my perspective on moving forward with my project that I'm working on. All right, send me the link. I'll have a look there. I will. Um, did, did you do a lot of uh, like hypnosis exercises or meditation exercises? I have done a lot of both and I go through kind of phases with it. I find, um, I've never been one that has like a, I haven't had like a daily meditation practice necessarily. Like over the last three years, I go through phases of like meditating a lot, not meditating at all. Um, and I kind of give myself permission to move through that. I think a lot of people have ideas that like, in order to be a successful person, I have to wake up at 5 a.m. I have to work out. I have to meditate. I have to journal. I have to, you know, do all these things. And it feels like so much pressure to do all these things to show up in this way. Pressure kills you slowly. 
kills you. And it's like, if you aren't, if you're going from like zero to a hundred, like you don't journal, you don't meditate, you don't work out. If you don't, you get up at nine and you're trying to get up at five, like you are like heading towards failure. Like it's inevitable failure at that point, because it's like such a big stretch from where you currently are. So I always recommend people to like make small steps and in small increments um, and honor yourself and where you're at. And like, there's definitely been times where sometimes I feel like I need to and want to meditate for like an hour a day. And then there's times where like, I won't meditate for six months. Yeah. So, um, and I used to be really judgmental of myself for that being like, oh, if I'm going to be successful, I need to be doing like X, Y, Z, whatever. Um, but really I think that meditation, journaling, any of these things are practices that can support you, but also recognizing that something like going for a walk, talking to a friend, like these can also be exercises that support you. And just like using your discernment to know what in the moment you need to support yourself and to help get you through to that next step. And there may be some resistance around it. So just, again, it comes back to being the observer, being the witness of your internal experience and noticing, are you making the decision not to meditate because you'd rather be going for a walk because that feels more expansive? Or are you making the decision not to meditate because you're avoiding what might come through in meditation? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really um, important kind of like um, distinction to make. Yeah, that's an, that's an interesting question. Some people might be afraid to answer it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Have you been... Um, just a quick question. Have you been listening to uh, maybe Jordan Peterson and his work? Um, no. he, he's a, like a clinical psychologist and he got okay. really, really popular in the last few years um, because he was recording his lectures on a, he's, he's also, uh, he's a clinical practitioner and also on a college. Um, I don't know what it was, Oxford, Stanford, you know, one of the uh, really, mm -hmm. really good ones. And uh, he started recording his lectures and gained huge popularity online. Oh, okay. on he's super smart. Uh, he's very religious. And he's also like very, um, he, he often gets quoted and the video titles show like word porn because how he structures his sentences is, is, is just amazing. You like listen to it and you're like, wow, this is an awesome. And then you like rewind it again and it sounds better and better. Um, he really has a way with words and um, he reflects on a lot of um, topics that we just went through, um, but he kind of structures it really, really well. I, I think he did a lot of debates. So everything that he structures and talks about, it's kind of like said in a way, if you were to and dissect it and try to attack it you will have a really really hard time you know so all his mm -hmm. sentences are kind of on point um and i love how his mind works and he uh, mentions a lot of concepts that um you know like people overload themselves or judge themselves or um go into places where you know everything's against you and then you're against yourself like you, you don't need the extra like thing bringing you down like mm -hmm. um he wrote um Two books i think one of them is 12 rules for life and uh, he does a lot of like really good tips in there that are kind of like i would love to say easy to implement you know but uh he does in theory a deep perspective um like the, the first rule in his book is like set your house in order uh which sounds like clean up your room but as the deeper you go the more it's like kinda, the relationships in your house the how you feel your inner like the house can be a metaphor for your mind you know and totally. all of his concepts are brilliant like that i highly recommend you checking him out he's, he's really, really i will cool. And yeah. the cleaning up your house physically is also very important too. It's yeah. something that I have a lot of my clients do um, when we're working together. I'll have them do like a high self practice where they meet their high self and familiarize themselves with her and then, or him. Um, and then um, what I have them do is kind of like assess, you know, what in their life whether it's in their physical environment, their internal environment, whatever is or isn't in line with their high self and doing a physical cleansing of the things that like, maybe it's like clothes that you're hanging on to that like no longer fit you or that you haven't worn in six years or whatever. Yeah. Or maybe it's, you know, like your house is just like a mess and you need to actually like physically clean it and go around and dust and vacuum and whatever, like thinking about like, how does my high self live? Mm -hmm. What are the things she allows or he allows into his environment? Um, from a physical like and energetic aspect. 
do you have people like take their phone and show you their house and be like, no, I no, haven't done that. that back in order, like, <laughs> your couch. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no, I haven't gone that far, but, um, I trust that they're doing the work for themselves. So yeah, I think that is important though. You know, like your environment really does stimulate your external environment is a reflection of your internal environment. And mm -hmm. of course, what we want to do is quote unquote, clean up the internal environment by like letting go of the things that aren't serving you and that don't belong to you and whatever. Um, but a great way to start that can actually be starting in the physical and starting to clean up the external. And then that kind of creates some momentum too. Yeah, I agree. Um, how do you structure your days? How does your daily routine look like? Yeah, it's a little different every day. Um, so <laughs> If anyone listening is into human design, I'm a reflector by human design, which means that um, reflectors, so human design, there's five different like types for human design. There's manifesting generator, generator, manifester, reflector, and projector. And um, that's gonna like to get deep into it would be a whole nother conversation. But as a reflector, we are kind of led by the moon. And um, Basic, the moon is different every single day of the month and so is a reflector. So I try not to be too rigid with myself and my schedule. I do have some things that I like to do every day um, to, as anchor points, but I try to allow myself to flow within those anchor points. And like I was saying, I'm not like, I get up at 5 a.m. every day and then I work out and then I meditate and then I do yoga and then I like have a coffee, have a shower, get into work. Like I don't, I don't have that rigid of a structure at all. Um, I like to allow myself to flow. So my kind of anchor points are like, I get up in the morning, I cuddle with my dog. I, <laughs> it's a great way to start the day. Um, I'll like Especially have a tea. Either. Yeah, totally. I'll like have a tea. Um, I'll maybe have a shower, get ready. And then kind of like allow myself to like ease my way into my day. And then I'll usually do work for a couple hours, go for a walk or maybe do some yoga in the afternoon. It's usually a walk because um, it's nice to get outside. And then come back, maybe do a little bit more work, have dinner, and then kind of like, if I, depending on the night, I kind of alternate between like, maybe I'll just have a chill night and read my book or watch a movie, or maybe I'm, I have a couple programs that I'm currently in, um, working on some creative projects. So, you know, maybe spending some time doing that. And then I usually try to do some yoga or some stretching or a meditation before bed. Mm -hmm. um, something to kind of still the mind, process the day. Um, and I also do have a, a, a loose journaling practice. It's not like super um, rigid. I have a gratitude journal, the five minute journal, if you've heard of it. Yeah. So starting off awesome. in the morning with three things of gratitude, three intentions for the day and an affirmation, and then ending the day with like three things that were great. And like one thing that could have been better. Um, I don't always fill out the one thing that could have been better. Cause sometimes I just don't feel like I need to like be picking myself apart in that way. It's kind of like, Hey, today was like, maybe like the thing that could have been better was like offer myself some compassion that I didn't get everything done, you know? Yeah. Um, so I do have that. And then I have a couple other journals too. I have a journal by Amber Ray, actually. It's like a feeling it's the choose worry or choose wonder over worry journal. It's like a feelings journal, um, which I use kind of as my brain dump space. So I don't mm -hmm. write in it every day. I probably write in it like once or twice a week at, at most. Um, mm -hmm. but whenever I'm feeling like I just like need to process some stuff, I'll do some writing, but I'm pretty fluid with my day, honestly. Um, but I am quite self-directed once I'm in work, usually like I'm working, I work pretty solid for a couple of hours. And then I allow myself to take a nice, like hour long break to go for a walk, have some lunch, whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I allow myself to be fluid within it. I don't really believe in like super rigid schedules. That's like, I started my own business to have the freedom to start my work day at 10 if I wanted to take a break at noon if I want to you know maybe finish at three or whatever and go to a dance class or whatever I want to do so mm -hmm. I I didn't create my business to be like rigidly working nine to five yeah yeah um that's awesome and um I kind of figured that out um uh, in this <laughs> crazy 2020 um we had to work from home and I was always kind of I don't know I, I didn't even consider it and after it happened I was like you know, I like this. I could schedule my own day and I, I saw a lot of benefits uh, in working from home. Um, one of them was not actually wasting time on travel to get to work every day. It's like yeah. two hours. It's like five days a week. That's 10 hours by 50 weeks. It's like 500 hours. 
Jesus, like five hundred dollars is really, really a lot of time, you know. A lot. Um, so yeah, um, I, I prefer it that way. And um, I noticed a lot of stuff. Like um, sometimes I, I get into a workflow later in the evening, not early mm-hmm. in the day. And yeah. the other day I was editing videos for my channel, and I stayed up until like three o'clock in the morning. Like you, and I really finished them. I really put in a lot of effort. But you couldn't do that if you had to go to work tomorrow at six o'clock, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, that's kind of uh, limiting us there. But yeah, totally. We schedule our own time. We we get uh, a lot more benefits out of it. Uh, I agree on that. Um, all right. Um, yeah. Tell me, tell me, Rachel. Um, what's one of the things that um, like uh, impact you the most in the last year, or how did the last year impact you? Um, what are maybe some of the uh, toughest things that you've been through and some of one of the best things that you learned mm-hmm. i always get, like to reflect uh on it like like that at the end of the year and at the start of a new year right yeah 2020 honestly for me was the reset that i needed and i had already kind of so i know for a lot of people 2020 was like the crumbling where everything fell apart and life was a shit show that was my life in 2019 so i was like ahead of the curve a little bit So I had had some like really deep, like breakdowns in 2019. And it was a like really friggin' hard year, the last half of the year, especially my whole life was turned upside down and I moved back to my hometown, something I never thought I'd do. I'm still here over a year later because of COVID, but it's great. Um, So 2020 for me was, but even so I was still like mending from 2019 and early 2020, especially. And I feel like I was actually thinking about this while I was getting ready this morning. Um, I'm still in a process of healing and mending from 2019, you know, like there's no need to rush your healing. So if you're in a state of healing from whatever has been going on the last year, a couple of years, whatever, um, give yourself permission to be in that state of healing. Um, and just because you're healing doesn't mean you can't be doing the shit that you want to do. Um, so for me, 2020 was permission to, I actually closed my business for three months of 2020 and I was just burnt out. I needed a break. I was so exhausted. I didn't have the energy or mental capacity or anything to do anything. So I closed everything down. Basically once COVID hit, I was just like, I can't right now. And that was the best decision I could have made for myself. And I think that that's something that people think like, once you start a business, you just have to like, go, 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 Mm -hmm. keep going. Like, you know, continually to like push through and, you know, do whatever, whatever it is you think you should be doing. And I think the permission to do things your way, to let go of the expectations that you have, they're only expectations you put on yourself nobody else is having them of you Mm -hmm. um to just do things your way and like stop and slow down and reevaluate is really precious so it gave me a lot of permission to just like close everything up and take time for myself and think about what i wanted and what i wanted was to have more fun in my life Mm because i felt like my whole life had become about my business which i think happens to a lot of entrepreneurs and that's a dangerous place to be because yeah, your business should fuel you, but, and you should enjoy it. But I got to a point where it was like, I wasn't even really enjoying it because all I was doing was my business. And I felt stressed out about it all the time. Yeah. So I took time off to allow myself some space. And then I came back in June of last year and things have been better than ever. And I have more balance in my life. I prioritize my life around my business instead of the other way around. Like yeah. When I was living in London in 2018, 2019, I didn't even feel like I had the time to take in the middle of the day to go for a walk, even though I was running my own business and making my own schedule. I felt like I needed to be working like all the time. Mm -hmm. And now I, like I was saying with my current schedule, allow a lot more flow. Uh, Was it like, was it necessary that you had to work that much to kind of have the financials in, in check? Or was it that you just kind of mentally felt the pressure that you had to work? Yeah, it was the pressure. It was totally the pressure of feeling like I need to do this in order to, like, I have big goals with my business. And I think that there can be a lot of distortion in the online space 
in the online business world, like you see a lot of people that are like, I went from like zero to like 30 K months in like 90 days. And it's just like, okay, but like, what did you do for the year or two before that? Like, what are you not telling us about your journey? Because nine times out of 10, like there might be that one off chance where someone literally went from like, I have no business to like, I'm making 30 K months in 90 days. It's not that that's not possible, but that's not most people's reality. Those are unicorns. Yeah, exactly. And I'm not a, like, as a reflector, I'm a unicorn because we're only 1% of the population. As a business owner, I'm not a fucking unicorn. I didn't go from $0 to 30K months in 90 days. And that's fine. So I, in 2019, I had, I was in this kind of like group of online entrepreneurs that were all like gunning for these 30K months. And I couldn't keep up because my energetic, like energetically, I could not sustain it. And it wasn't, it just like wasn't aligned for me. And I burnt myself out trying to like, like keeping up with like everyone else. Yeah. Um, so I think, I don't remember what the question even was at this point. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah um, I'm sorry. I've lost, I've lost where I was going with that. <laughs> it's fine. Um, tell us some of your goals for the future, for the business, for Rachel, for uh, higher Rachel for everything. Yeah. Ooh. So, um, I have lots of big goals. I do want to hit those bigger months, um, income wise. Um, so I have lots of goals with that right now. Like my business is pretty like hourly based. Like a lot of my income is coming from hourly based work. Mm -hmm. Um, which there's nothing wrong with, but there's only so many hours that you have in the day. I don't want to be working every hour of the day. So I am looking to find ways to scale my business that don't require me to work more hours. Mm -hmm. So that means creating some passive income. I've, I have a few different ideas, but I'm not, none of them are fully formed yet. So I'm not going to share any of them yet. Uh Um, but some, some courses that are kind of percolating and different things that are coming through. Um, one thing that I am working on that I'm really excited about is a book that I'm writing. So yeah, I see my business kind of heading in the direction of like being like being like a speaker and being a writer and being a leader. Um, you know, like some of those people that I mentioned earlier, you know, like Amber Ray and Brene Brown and doing some stuff like that. And then doing some like consulting and stuff as well. And hopefully the podcast continues to take off too. So those are kind of the directions that I see myself heading in and ways that I can make like income that don't require me to be working like dollars for hours kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. I agree on that one. Um, that's one of my big focuses for this year to um, step more into the passive or online income um, mm-hmm. space. So yeah, um, podcasting and YouTube are one of the mains there and I, I do yeah. use social media a lot. And um, yeah. I'm also looking into passive income schemes. Let's call mm-hmm. them like that. <laughs> um, I, I look a lot towards um, affiliate marketing like Amazon and stuff like that. Um, so from, from what I can see, I would recommend that to you as well because you do talk a lot about um, a lot of stuff that can be linked through affiliate mm-hmm. and I, I, I sort of feel that a lot of business online is going towards the directions uh, not just by youtubers promoting stuff uh, but a lot of companies have like if you find someone who starts using our product we'll give you a small totally bonus or uh, like even if you bring like multiple people on you get something uh, recurring so that, that's awesome in my opinion because people yeah. will have multiple streams of income and that will affect their lives um especially now when a lot more people need it so Mm -hmm. yeah i'm I'm looking forward to that and um i I hope that in the future maybe we can exchange more ideas about that yeah would love that um tell me rachel as we're kind of going towards the end of the podcast there um as i said it's called the uncle gold podcast because i feel that most people haven't found their gold in life quote Mm -hmm. unquote there and they didn't have a rich uncle who told them how to do it you know (laughs) Um, do you have like tips for people how to get their gold in life or what would it be or how to get there? Mm. I think it comes back to what I was saying earlier, but about listening to what is in your heart, what is burning within you is there for a reason. So listen to it and take 
daily action on it. And that doesn't have to be big action. It could just be a little thing. Like I was saying, sending an email or whatever, writing in your journal or meditating, you know, taking small daily action towards whatever it is that's burning within you. Cause it's there for a reason. Um, and don't letting that fire within you die out, you know, continue to stoke the fire, continue to follow, follow it. I think that's the biggest thing is, um, not giving into corporate pressures or societal pressures or family pressures, you know, like we are, we have one life in this body. So how do you want to express that? How do you want to enjoy your life? Um, and I, Ashley and I actually did a podcast last year around kind of around this, like, like I was saying earlier about being burnt out from business and work. And it's like, yes, my business is like one aspect of my life and I love it. Um, but it's not the center of my universe. It's not my son. My son is my joy. You know, my son is my life, my desire, um, that zest, right? So tune into that, your zest for life, your joy, your play, your pleasure, your desire, and allow that to guide you. Um, that's what I've really been tapping into over this last year. Like I was saying with, you know, getting that burnout from being in the online space and the pressures of how I thought I needed to show up and giving myself permission to let it all go and follow what was in here versus what I was hearing, you know, out here from all these other people has really allowed me to enjoy my life more, enjoy my business more. I feel more successful. I am actually more successful by a financial rate as well, which is great. Um, but it's not about the money. Yes. But it's about what the money gives you and the opportunity it gives you. And I mean, I have really big goals financially because I would love to like take my whole family on a, on a holiday and like, you know, treat my mom and her husband and, you know, all these things that I would love to do for them because they've done a lot for me. Um, so yeah, I think it's just about like tuning into that desire and really allowing yourself to be guided by it and not allowing outside forces to squash that fire. I agree on that. And that's an awesome goal that you want to do for your, uh, family. Um, you said a big thing there, like giving yourself permission. I agree on that one hundred percent. I feel that a lot of us are kind of keeping ourselves down, you know, like basically nothing's holding you back apart from yourself right there are external mm -hmm. factors and things that you have to take into account yeah but most people don't do it make it or change it just because on their own it's their belief system you know, like yeah it, it's not leveled yet yeah absolutely it's the belief system that we have based on the external factors that we see and how we internalize them so how can you change the story of what you're experiencing mm. and really create a new dialogue for yourself. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, Rachel, uh, where can people find you if they want to reach out or connect to you more? Yeah. So I'm on Instagram, although I'm on a kind of a social media hiatus right now. Um, just as I'm, like I said, I'm in this creative container with Amber Ray. It's a 10 week container where I'm working on writing my book. So I have taken a step away from social media to be in my creativity and in my life instead of in my social media presence. Um, but you can find me. It's at rachel.bradbury on Instagram. Um, I'm on Facebook. I don't really use it that much though. So Instagram's probably the best spot. And then, yeah, if you want to follow us for the podcast as well, it's at hashtag relatable podcast. And you can find us also on Amazon or on not Amazon, um, Apple and maybe Amazon. I don't know. Um, probably. <laughs> <laughs> probably we're everywhere. Um, Apple and, and Spotify for sure though. And yeah, we'll be starting that up again in February. So if you want to Give us a follow, catch up on the last 52 episodes and we'll be starting out fresh again uh, next month. So Nice. Awesome. Looking forward to it. I'll have a listen to it. And uh, tell me, do you use LinkedIn maybe? I actually do have a LinkedIn. It's funny you say that. I was literally just on my LinkedIn two days ago because I like never use it. But mm -hmm. um, I had an intu intuitive hit to go on there and I had a bunch of people that re requested connections and um I need to go in and revamp my LinkedIn, but I do, I do have some intention to revamp that and use that. Cause I think that LinkedIn, um, is kind of an untapped resource outside of corporate. And I think that it can really be used for entrepreneurial benefit as yeah. well. So, yeah. um, yeah, I do plan to, to revamp that as well. So you can just find me. It's just Rachel Bradbury on LinkedIn. 
you'll see you'll see my face you'll recognize me <laughs> all right uh i'm a big gary v fan and i've used linkedin for a while now and uh in, it, he's just right about it you know like it's, it's super useful and i would recommend it to anybody listening especially if you want to like scale your business or connect to people it's it's awesome again it's so searchable too right like it's yeah. got there's a lot of resources within that platform i actually have a friend who works at linkedin um that I sh should reach out to to get all the tips and tricks and insider. Yeah, Maybe yeah. I can connect you the with secret her. Sauce. <laughs> yeah, all the secret sauce, exactly. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Um, Rachel, it was uh, lovely chatting to you. I would love to have you uh, back on on the podcast um, maybe end of this year to hear how, how your business is going. And yeah. uh, it, it was great chatting with you. Thank you again for waking up earlier. I know it's a time oh, it's, no. there, I'm always up early. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. yeah it, it was a pleasure thank you so much for having me and uh yeah i just really enjoyed this conversation it was really fun awesome thank you uh and thank thanks you. for everyone who's still here uh it was a little bit longer but i feel that we've gone into some really cool topics and i hope you guys got a lot of value out of this uh please leave us a comment below what are what were your favorite bits and parts um what were some of the things that you learned that you didn't know before uh, what were some of the things that you maybe want to hear more about in the future and yeah we hope you learn a lot from this podcast and we'll see you in the next one thanks guys thanks for Thank watching you the uncle gold podcast